Hi, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. We are taking a break from our regularly scheduled programming for another special guest episode today. This is the eighth episode in a series where I converse with classicists and ancient historians about either books or articles that they have published, their current research interests, or just unique classes and topics that they are teaching and exploring further. In today's special guest episode, I am joined by Dr. Owen Rees, a freelance historian, writer, and researcher. He studied ancient history at the University of Reading and history research at the University of Nottingham. He is an assistant editor to Sparta, Journal of Ancient Spartan and Greek History, and a regular contributor to Ancient Warfare magazine. He also has published two books on the topic of ancient Greek warfare, Great Battles of the Classical Greek World and Great Naval Battles of the Ancient Greek World. On episode 13, we previously covered hoplite warfare, but that was four years ago and when I first started the podcast. With four years of experience under my belt, and with a bit of hindsight, I don't feel as if I did the topic it's due, and you will hear why later. And so one day I plan to redo it. Until then, Dr. Reese was kind enough to come on to discuss ancient Greek warfare more generally. Though we focus specifically on land warfare here, as there will be a future special guest episode just on naval. We go into lengthy discussions on the definition of a hoplite, its socio-political importance, and the problems surrounding its chronology and historiographic tradition. We also discuss the problems with the traditional reconstructive models of ancient Greek battles, the important role of cavalry and light infantry, particularly in the Peloponnesian War onwards, and why the concept of an honorable Western way of war, which seeks its origins in ancient Greek warfare, is bogus and hyped up in modern ideology. There are also lots of digressions on logistics, slaves, baggage trains, training, the Spartan mirage, the brutal experience of war, the fear that it instilled, and the war dead. Finally, Dr. Rees discusses his most recent research and the topic of his next book, which involves the transition of soldiers from civilian life to the battlefield and back again, including all the psychological and sociological problems that arise from this. And so without further ado, here is my discussion with Dr. Owen Reese. I did an episode 13 on hoplite warfare, but I was pretty focused more on one scholarship thought of how they fought. And I didn't know that until after the fact, because yeah. that was mainly the only books that I had <laughs> until later that I started getting a other different sources. So yeah. um, I've always wanted to redo that episode, but until then... I brought on Owen Reese, and he's going to talk about some of the newer interpretations and especially the difficulty in the sources, uh, because I didn't really expound upon that, how sketchy the sources are when I put together my early episodes. I do that now. I make sure to put stuff that in. Experience is the best teacher, so (laughs) all we can do is is learn from our mistakes and move forward. So uh, thank you for coming on, Owen. It's great to meet you. I've read some of your books about battle, uh, the naval one and the classical battles, and they've been pretty helpful in putting together some of my episodes where I have trouble visualizing some things. So thank you for agreeing to come on, and thank you for writing your books. (laughs) Thanks for for having me on, and indeed, thanks for reading them. (laughs) It's it's one of those things where you write these books, and a bit bit like you've said before with your podcast, you, you never really imagine someone reading them or listening to it until you meet someone who does really <laughs> and that's a bit humbling i guess <laughs> yes yes it certainly is um i don't know about you but i then get very paranoid <laughs> did they find a mistake <laughs> is there a typo on page one i get that way all the time when people ask me questions of like an episode i did three years ago and then they're expecting like a full-on dissertation answer and i'm just like i my brain has dumped <laughs> that i've moved on to whatever is in the fifth century or whatever and i have to go back and read the notes that i have yeah. in order to adequately answer yeah, the question i can completely relate to this so for instance these books are written for a popular audience and so it made me go in depth on a lot of narrative and if we had this interview two years ago i'd have talked you through the entire story of every single battle there was <laughs> now it's it's not my research focus now my um I'm mean, going to talk about it later. My research is more the experience of battle rather than the narratives of battle. But, you know, I know people who do, and it's a very impressive encyclopedic knowledge some people have. I had that when I was in my early 20s, but now that I've pushed the 30 threshold, yeah. <laughs> you can only fit so many penguins on your iceberg now. And when you add more, some things fall off. But I keep my transcripts so I can always go back and read what I said, and it jogs my memory, but it's just not there at the tip of the, the brain every instant. <laughs> 
I just don't see there's much point in um, trying to hold on to so much information. And since I've had kids, I have to hold on to ridiculous information about cartoons <laughs> and things. And, um, you know, Frozen, Frozen 2, <laughs> I'll tell you that now. Day to day, that's more important, isn't it? It's, mm-hmm. uh, that's the information you need to hold on to. This is the importance of note taking, isn't it? It's the importance of keeping hold of your notes and maintaining them. I've got folders and folders of old projects that I'll never get rid of for this exact reason. We can't all be Socrates. Abhor note-taking. <laughs> I'd like to point out, Socrates gets away with a lot by just asking questions. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. You, you deflect blame on yourself by pointing it at others. <laughs> exactly. I think it's notable that it's the people after him, it's Aristotle and it's Plato uh, immediately after him, who seem to be the fastidious note-takers. And perhaps there's a, a direct correlation there. Mm-hmm. So um, we're going to start out talking about hoplite warfare, and then we'll switch into like the other types of warfare, cavalry, light infantry, that sort of stuff, because it's not all hoplites. Contrary to popular belief, <laughs> it's not all hoplites until you get to Alexander. Oh, then he obsesses. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it wasn't all hoplites, but the more I dug into the Peloponnesian War, I realized how like crucial light infantry became. Yeah. Again, we're digression before we even start, so <laughs> going swell. All right. When you're putting together scholarship on classical warfare, hoplite warfare in general, what do we have for sure? What are some of the difficulties? What are some of the problems in your field? So the biggest problem you have in my field of work is probably two strands. Uh, First is definition. What actually is a hoplite? Because the Greek doesn't always discuss hoplites. It could just discuss sort of generic words for fighter or soldier. Let's say combatant, probably a more accurate word. So, you know, we often project the idea of a hoplite onto a text when actually that's not what the Greek has said. And then you've got to ask the question, well, did it mean it or did it not? Did they purposely not use hoplite or did they just use a generic word like we would? You know, we talk about an infantryman, we talk about a soldier, we talk about a combatant, often to describe the same people. I know most of our sources in general are Athenian. Was a hoplite, was it a term that was used by every city-state? Therein lies uh, problem number two, which is our (laughs) our evidence base. Uh, (laughs) Because the majority is Athenian, I can tell you categorically the Athenians did. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, it, it is assumed that it is. And when we do find evidence, whether it's, say, inscriptions or the like, Corinth, Argos, Sparta, etc. Hoplite is a generic word. Of course, the word itself is kind of a vague one. We use it in our writing, especially in the popular field. We use it as if it's a really defined type of warrior. You know, it's heavy infantrymen who wore a particular kit and fought in a particular formation. Whereas actually hoplite comes from the word hopla, which literally just means equipment. And that is all it means. So a hoplite is someone with equipment if you want to use it literally. Even if we go, okay, so yes, Thucydides, for argument's sake, says there are 13,000 hoplites. Do we envisage 13,000 men arrayed in the exact same kit, fighting in the exact same way? As you've become more aware of reading, this becomes more and more problematic. To the point where we see rowers being handed a spear and a shield and told to get in a phalanx, and then they've become a hoplite all of a sudden. And you're like, but you were a rower like two minutes ago. So there's this really vague definition that we probably make too much of. Um, Ultimately, for me, a hoplite, as long as you've got the aspis, which is that kind of domed round shield characteristic of a classical period in particular, as long as you've got that and preferably an offensive weapon, whether the doru, which is the spear, or a sword of some description, depending on which polish you're from, that seems to be enough to be classified as a hoplite, even if it's temporary. But I guess technically wouldn't even need an offensive weapon if you were stuck in like the middle rows yeah. where all you're doing is just pushing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a valid point. Uh, do you even need an offensive weapon? No, not really. It's the shield. It seems to be the characteristic of a hoplite needs to be holding that shield, which I should remind the word is aspis. There is a long historiographical tradition. Hoplite comes from the word hoplon, which meant shield. And this is basically invented. It's a completely made up etymology by the Byzantine period, I think. Um, And it's something we still see in a lot of history books today. 
pretty sure I put that in my podcast too. So. Oh, good. <laughs> I will recommend it to all my students now. <laughs> but I did call it an aspis as well. I think. <laughs> and this is one of the things where we are all guided by the literature we read. But yeah, aspis, aspis is the word for this shield. And the shield seems to be the real iconographic marker, the real defining feature of a hot plight, if you're going to try and find one. So uh, aspis is the shield specifically. Hopla or hoplon is just generic. Equipment. Yeah, it's just generic kit. That's never defined. It's one of those, you know, again, the way we talk about it, you think there'd be a definition somewhere in like Thucydides or Xenophon who says this is what a hoplite has, but it doesn't. It's just not said anywhere. So a lot of that is our own projection. Is that something that is like defined later by, say, Roman sources, when, like Greek Roman sources? Sort of a Plutarch. Or who's, a, the, who's the guy that wrote the stratagems? Oh, Frontinus or um, Polyanus. Yeah. No, they don't. From what I've read, no, they don't seem to really categorically do it. I think it comes from um, mainly archaeology. We keep finding bits of kit. So, you know, when you find a load of bronze greaves and a load of uh, bronze helmets and bronze armor, why wouldn't you assume that one man wore it all? But I should point out, archaeologists have not been thinking this for years. This is historians just using archaeology as they want to, really. A lot of it comes from artistic portrayal as well. Um, a lot of Greek art shows hoplites in an array of armor. So I think it's just a kind of a composite, mash it all together, and that's what a hoplite should look like. So I could be wrong here, but when I always thought of like a hoplite with full armor, I always thought of when you hear later in Athenian sources, like the hoplite class, so like the upper middle class of Athenian society are the ones who had like the full on armor. Is that a false belief? Probably like the upper middle class people who had all the armor. You're right in terms of because each person who wants to serve as a hoplite in Athens, for instance, has to provide his own kit. And because you have to provide your own kit, you're immediately limited by your own financial capabilities. So you're absolutely right in that sense. If you're going to think of someone in the best, shiniest armor and in you know all the fads, you know all the different greaves, all the different bits of body armor, yes, that will be the richest end. There is a, a bit in Aristophanes' Acarnians, I think it is, in which they lampoon a general for basically having really nice equipment. And Xenophon, in one of his dialogues, has Socrates make a similar point. People who turn up with the nicest, prettiest, shiniest equipment are usually the least trustworthy and least reliable in a phalanx. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right in that respect. But you're also right in the respect of um, this means there's going to be disparity because whilst we talk about a hoplite class, like a middling class as people like to call it, in reality, it doesn't exist because you can't get the numbers of men in the field. The work of a academic Hans van Rees has very much highlighted what he calls like the working class hoplite. So a man who's not necessarily rich enough to sort of sit in that class that we think of, that kind of middling class, but did still serve as a hoplite in the phalanx. Whatever that looked like is now really up to our interpretation. So I think it was like the seventh century is when kind of came in piecemeal. Is that still the prevailing theory? It all comes down to how do you define a hoplite, I'm afraid. I mean, I don't subscribe to this, but it's only fair that we point out all the different views. Some people push this right back to Homer's texts, to the Iliad, and say there are hoplites, there's a phalanx, or the proto-phalanx, or a proto-hoplite there. That's kind of how, how important it is that these definitions are understood and how vague these definitions are. So for me, yeah, you're talking about 7th century, maybe earlier, but I wouldn't push that hard. And then the question is, you know, it's a chicken and egg question. Did the hoplite come first? Did the phalanx come first? Did the hoplite adapt to a phalanx or vice versa? You know, all these kind of issues which many a people spend their lives analysing and assessing. But uh, this is why I thank God regularly that I do classical Greek warfare. And I don't have to worry about this because they're already there. Yep, already there by Battle of Marathon, I suppose. Yeah, yeah Battle of Marathon. <laughs> I've got hoplites. I've got a phalanx-ish. <laughs> it's good <laughs> enough for me. So um, what is the earliest archaeological evidence? Is the Chigi vase still what is considered the earliest representation or is there something different now? Yeah, the Kiji vase is considered by many to be the earliest representation, mainly because it has what looks like hoplites. So men with the appropriate shield and the appropriate helmet for what we want a hoplite to look like. And they're painted in a line. But it's only one line, which is odd. It's only one line, yeah. And it's a tiny image on a massive vase. 
which is very notoriously difficult to interpret. Some people analyze vases like they're a comic book strip. Like you can read them as a series of stories that lead you on a narrative. I don't necessarily subscribe to that view. Others use it as a sort of iconographic markers of important things that a man does, and war being one of them, obviously. So, yeah, for me, it's not enough to be a, a phalanx, but many people do subscribe to this and hold it as the earliest. One of the other difficult things about that vase in particular is that Kiji vase was found in Italy and seems to have been made for an Italian market. I mean, from Greece, don't get me wrong, but for an Italian market. So you've also got to ask the question, how much of, does it reflect Greece at that point? How much does it reflect what the market in Italy wants Greece to look like or wants their own world to look like? We, we, there's just so much interpretation involved. And ultimately, vases are not photographs. and can't be treated like they are. It was from Corinth, right? Corinth had like a huge uh, industry in Etruria at that time. It's a sort of a proto-Corinthian vase, isn't it? Yeah, but found in an Etruscan tomb, don't forget. So we are in Italy. Again, this gives us an idea of just how overly complicated this can be. So it could just be Corinth's understanding of warfare at that time too. Could be Corinth's understanding of it or just an artistic portrayal of it. I mean, ultimately, how do you portray a battle of a lot of men in a very small space? You know, do we realistically think this is a, an actual battle formation being described? As you pointed out, it's only one line. So much interpretation problematic here. The other issue with art is, do you place the importance of the image on the artist or on the person who bought it? So was it ordered pre-made? Was it ordered to spec? If it's ordered to spec, that tells us more about Etruscan ideologies and artistic tropes. If it's just bought Having been made, that tells us more about Greek or Corinthian tropes. And I think about this with like vase painting in general. Most of the, the vase painters, at least in an Athenian society, I, I guess it would be similar to Corinthian society. They probably aren't the people who are going to be dressed completely in all of hoplite armor. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair, <laughs> that's a fair point, uh, depending on how successful their industry is. So I think about like vase painters is when they're drawing these images, do they consult professionals to make sure they get it technically right or is this just their interpretation of these events not necessarily hoplite warfare but anything in general that you'll find a vase image or is it just what they think it looks like or are they actually like hmm this looks like a good image let me go see somebody who actually does this and is, are they gonna sign off on it it's, it's an interesting question I've, I've just um finished some work on tattoos on greek vases so tattoos painted on the bodies on greek vases um and asking similar questions are these based on tattoos they've seen are these stereotypical tattoos is it just oh they're a barbaric thing so i'll make it look barbaric you know we, we really just don't know we can have a lot of fun with guessing <laughs> let's be honest there's very little that we actually know in the ancient world and that was always what's fascinating when i first came to it but yeah. you talk to a lot of people they think they know <laughs> when it's like no the more you learn the less you realize you don't actually know <laughs> you can have strong opinions <laughs> <laughs> well that's it you've got strong opinions and the amount of times you realize as you read more and more you've actually just sided with someone in an argument you just didn't know that you know because there is so much debate and there is so much disagreement on these things on, on all elements you know it's not just warfare it's not just art it's all elements of ancient history very little sources and you're looking to images on bases to determine how you <laughs> interpret something yeah it's gonna go awry uh, yeah this, this, <laughs> is, this is when um this is when you've got to work with your own methodologies, really. So for, for me, for many uh, academic these days, the idea of a historian or an ancient historian being someone who just reads texts is dying. A slow death, but it is dying. Um, and it's for this exact reason. Texts don't give us anywhere near the imagery and the colour and the, the specifics that art can give us. But on the same token, art doesn't give us any answers to our questions. So, you know, we need to go to the text for that. And of course, both of them rely on the archaeology. Ancient history is a multidisciplinary, is the buzzword. Uh, but it is, you know, you've got to be a historian, you've got to be a linguist, you've got to be an art historian, you've got to try and do all these things at once and bring it together. When I was in grad school, I was, you know, it's like I was taking ancient history classes and language classes. Yep. And it's like there was no re requisite for archaeology or art of history classes. And I know our historians and archaeologists are like, I've, I've seen them complain that why do I have to take so many language classes and they don't have to take languages in my discipline? And it's like, well, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the languages are necessary, but you're not just reading literature anymore. <laughs> 
No, and also, um, I think at some point we have to acknowledge that someone who spends their entire career studying a language, an artist, a historical period or whatever, is going to be better at it than someone who's trying to do all of these things at once. So for a lot of my work, I collaborate a lot. So, you know, I, you, you translate Greek, you work with it, but ultimately I know people who this is all they do. So if I'm not 100% sure with the translation, you go talk to someone who does this for a living 24 hours a day. And that's quite nice, especially with the advent of the internet. We're getting more of a community ethos in our studies. And I think it is, as a result, it's raising better questions and uh, scholarship's getting better as a result. You can tell the scholarship's getting better because the popular history is getting better. So whether it's podcasts like yourselves, I won't name my own books, but you know the uh, books of the likes of Penn and Sword, Osprey, these standards are rising dramatically. And I think that's a lot to do with it. Yeah, I would agree. All right, so I think we've hammered quite a bit on how <laughs> difficult it is to talk about <laughs> Um So we'll move more towards talking about the mechanics of combat and how one would experience warfare. Say, we'll go with the classical period when that's a bit more uh, relatively more understood. <laughs> I guess the first battle that we know for sure that hoplite phalanx warfare type of situation would have occurred would have been the Battle of Marathon, right? Yeah. It could have been before, but we have Herodotus. <laughs> yeah, we have Herodotus. Marathon is probably the the first real account we get of a Greek army in battle that's more than a couple of sentences. Should point out it's an anomaly as well, which is rather frustrating and kind of reminiscent of the Everest fallacy. So, you know, if you're going to use the Battle of Marathon to reconstruct Greek warfare, you're going to struggle. First of all, they seem to fight it in a ridiculous geographic location of uh, the sea to one side and sort of a hillock thing to the to the other, presuming you believe that reconstruction. <laughs> um, and they're fighting a force of various military cultures in the Persian ar- uh, army. Because, of course, Persia is not this monolithic military force. It's made up of Medes, Persians... Egyptians, Scythians, some Thracians, don't forget Greeks are also in the Persian army. And this is the army that the Athenians and the Plataeans face at Marathon. So it's one of those, I think a common theme throughout this is going to be the problems. Uh, and Marathon is certainly one of them. However, we do get the, the classic image of quote-unquote hoplite warfare. They don't mention any archers or light infantry. They don't mention any cavalry there at all. Doesn't mean they weren't there, but they're not described at all. They line up to face their Persian enemy. One thing we get immediately is the Greeks understand their own weaknesses. So the Greeks on the day are well aware that their biggest threat against them is the speed and the range of the Persian army. An army that uh, its strongest arm is its archers and its cavalry. The Greeks are very well aware of this, and we hear of them planning as best they can to nullify this. So we hear of them entering the field before the cavalry have managed to join the field themselves on the Persian side. And we hear of a famous charge. That is, the the Athenians and Plataeans decide rather than allow the storm of arrows to descend, they will run through it. I say run, jog. They will jog through it and face the Persians toe to toe because they know the only great strength they have is in hand-to-hand combat at close range. They must have been uh, practicing all along for the Hoplito Dromos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're spot on there. So again, you know, the people are capable of doing it. But the idea here is that this run is a tactical decision. It's shown to be the right one. But what's also interesting, as it appears in the first battle that we can really begin to reconstruct. It appears in pretty much every other battle hoplites take part in. So it is a clear moment in the beginning of a a Greek battle. Once they've lined up, once they've struck up the paean, which is that uh, almost like a war hymn, this sort of song, maybe a war cry to Anialius, who's a sort of a partial embodiment of Ares, god of war, then they charge. The reason why I sort of dwell on this is because to most people, If you envisage Greek hoplite warfare, hoplites are in a phalanx, and that phalanx is a line of tight, close, possibly, hoplites shield to shield, and then they run. 
So our image of this tight ranked phalanx doesn't fit with them running, unless we believe they're running within their formation, which seems pretty much impossible from other historical periods. Does that make sense? Do they run and then stop and regroup and form up right before battle? There is only one example where that happens that I know of, and that is at the Battle of Plataea by the Spartans. Obviously, it's something you'd have to train to do. (laughs) So if you have a contingent of multiple city-states, it it might not be the (laughs) best-looking maneuver. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you're spot on. And also, the Spartans, I say, I I use that kind of tongue-in-cheek as well, because Herodotus' narrative of Plataea, he's describing the Spartans being sort of showered with arrows whilst they've stopped. And it's because they're doing a sacrifice before every Greek battle. The general has to sacrifice and get the omens read. Because without good omens, you're not going to go into battle. The Spartans are notoriously pious about this. And so, you know, if Herodotus' account is to be believed, basically they, you know, slit the throat of, or the belly of a chicken or a goat or whatever it is. It's a bad omen. So they do it again. And then it's bad omen again. So they do it again. And they do it again. And they do it again whilst the arrows are raining down. Where are they getting all these chickens at? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> do they bring them to the battlefield? <laughs> uh, you wonder how many they bring. Yeah, do you have a, like a herd a herd of goats with you? I mean, this is the problem of reconstructing it. Herodotus is not an eyewitness. He is not a primary source, ironically. So, you know, you've got to take a lot of this tongue-in-cheek and with a pinch of salt. But this is the story we have. And it's the Tegeans, I think it is, who basically charge on their own because the Spartans are still sacrificing these bloody animals, trying to get the omens read. And then the Tegeans basically engage and then the Spartans finally, they finally get the good omen and then they do it. So this is basically the only example I can think of where we have this definite pause. Um, But Herodotus seems to be telling us this to kind of make a point about Spartan practice. It doesn't happen again, so I'm a bit suspicious as to whether or not this is a real a real account. They do a lot of sacrifices before they leave Laconia, too. Yes, yeah, they do. You would know more than me, but I don't remember many other instances where it's, like in Thucydides, where he mentions it before a battle. Uh, but there was a famous time where they, they wouldn't leave Laconia because the sacrifices were bad, and so Argos kept getting shwanked by the Athenians. This was before the Battle of Mantinea. But that's, I can't think of any pre-battle. We know Thucydides is a pragmatist. He often reuses religion or religious omen readings in particular to make a point. So he often makes a point about the Spartans, for instance, whenever we see an omen being read and it being bad, and therefore war or battle or, or an expedition is not pursued. It is almost always a Spartan army to make that point. However, we know categorically that pretty much every Greek army sacrificed before they left their home city, sacrificed before they decided to make any major decisions on the campaign. They sacrificed before battle. We've got more than enough evidence. If you want evidence for sacrifice before battle, you want to read Xenophon. Because Xenophon is a, he's almost the reverse on Thucydides with this, which is he's a, he's a stickler for these things being done right. Now that I think about it, Plutarch has a lot of it too, especially before the Sicilian expedition, before the Athenians launched. There was quite a bit of omens taking place from the Athenians. Yeah, and that's, he's taken that from Thucydides. Thucydides, when he describes the armada being put together and then sent out, it's actually probably the best account we have of an army leaving for war especially Athenians. So like you say, we've got the rituals of the Spartans because of Xenophon. Xenophon describes this in his Constitution of the Spartans. Thucydides' only real description of the Athenians doing this is the Sicilian expedition. And again, I don't think I'll ruin the chronology for your podcast, but the Sicilian expedition... That was the last episode I released. Oh, brilliant. (laughs) Brilliant. It ends terribly. Um, And of course, Thucydides is writing when everyone knows this. So he's really building up the uh, the pathos of what's going on that whole episode of the forces coming together meeting at the Piraeus you know describes it as the greatest force that's ever been put together uh, he then disagrees with himself but still says it's magnificent you know he's really building the pathos because whilst we like to think of him as a historian and the great historian possibly the first scientific historian these are the kind of labels we throw at him 
His work is literature. He is telling stories. He is making up speeches. He is creating characters purposefully. I've noticed that he does that quite a bit when anything is involved with Alcibiades. Yes. Or Cleon in the other direction. <laughs> oh, yeah. He hates Cleon. <laughs> um, and of course, the other one, the one that gives this away is Brasidas. Because Brasidas, the Spartan commander who single-handedly takes the areas around Chalcedonia in the north, is formed by Thucydides to be, I think, unarguably the greatest commander in Thucydides. Um, when you see what he does, what he achieves, with no Spartan backing whatsoever because they don't trust it, he, they refuse him reinforcements. Brasidas is the greatest commander in the entire work of Thucydides. And there's a reason for that. And that's because Brasidas beat Thucydides. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's not subtle. <laughs> I always wish Plutarch did a life of Brasidas. Yes, that'd be amazing. I think the giveaway with Brasidas is that he turns up randomly at the Battle of Pylos. You know, the great Spartan defeat. Uh, but Brasidas is there heroically fighting on his own whilst everyone else is losing. That's when you kind of think, eh, I think you're making this up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway... Go back to Marathon. I mean, it's the same. It's one of those annoying things where, you know, uh, if you want to look at hoplite warfare, origin of phalanx warfare, things like that, everyone points to the Persian Wars, which is immediately an anomaly because they're fighting a foreign enemy, which has a very unique makeup of its army. To understand Greek warfare, really, you need to see Greeks fighting Greeks. Only then can you see, actually, what is Greek warfare? Not supposed to look like, but you know what is what does Greek warfare normally look like? So, like in say the sixth century, do we have many sources that talk about you know when Sparta fights the Tegeans or Athenians and um, fighting their neighbors, the Megarians and Salaminians? And do we have much evidence? I know, I know Plutarch. It could be anachronistic when he describes it. He's way later, or is the best evidence for Greek warfare against a foreign enemy? I've got to be very careful because I've got friends who work on archaic warfare <laughs> and they will get very upset. But no, it's just, there isn't enough literary account. There we go. That's nicer. There isn't enough literary accounts to really reconstruct a broad consensus of warfare in the last archaic period. Was that diplomatic enough? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you. Yeah, it starts with Herodotus. And of course, the great irony of that is that Herodotus is talking about, obviously, 490 being the Battle of Marathon, 480s, uh, the Xerxes invasions. He himself is not writing until much later. So he is obviously also influenced by what is going on around him when he's writing about warfare from maybe 40, 50 years earlier, depending on when you think Herodotus started writing. So again, there's, there's a lot to unpick. It doesn't mean it can't be used. But there is a lot to unpick. Yeah, absolutely. We can get to that. Uh, the 5th century, there's significant change <laughs> in a lot of tactics and strategy and the, just fighting in general. The Peloponnesian War had a lot to do with that and the length of it <laughs> and brutality of it. <laughs> the brutality of it, the length of it. Also, the Athenian Empire had a lot to do with this because we don't really talk about... The word revolution gets thrown around a lot and I don't think it's appropriate for this. However, what the Athenian Empire achieved was to uh, accumulate enough money. And no polis had ever really accumulated enough money to actually start sending out armies of the kind of size we see in the Peloponnesian War or the number of armies that are sent out in the Peloponnesian War. You know, during the Peloponnesian War, Athens sends out an army of, was it 7,000 to Delium, whilst another 3,000 are elsewhere, another 2,000 are even further afield in the Aegean. Um, that's a lot of men out on various campaigns and it's only really Athens that seems to be able to finance that for as long as they were able to so um, length of the war absolutely the brutality of the war absolutely but also the financing which of course as you get nearer to the end of the Peloponnesian war in your narrative I've no doubt we'll spend a long time on Persian financing and the importance of Persia in this the next episode that I'm working on right now Tissaphernes and Barnabasis starting to pop up mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. Um, and that's why Persian money was so important. Because, of course, we're going to spend most of today only talking about land battles. But, of course, a navy is much more expensive. Mm -hmm, for sure. The Athenians 
I mean, could be in the Greeks in general, but they paid their soldiers when they were out and campaign was a drachma a day. Yep. Whereas like the Romans didn't really get that until the Marian reforms. It's a lot different as you, you see the evolution of the two type of armies where it's like the Athenians were getting paid so they didn't come back and they were poor. Whereas <laughs> you see a lot of that with the Romans when they started sending out some of their imperial ambitions. So it costs a lot of money, basically. <laughs> yeah, it costs a lot. But well, and, um, I think that has something to do with the Athenian direct democracy. Because, of course, if a, a raid to Megara, which is only just over the road, was much easier to get through the assembly for a vote than, say, you know, sending 2,000 men to Potidaea a day or two sail away for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, you've got to remember that any military expedition has to be voted by the people who will end up manning that expedition. And ultimately, if they're afraid of paying bills, for one of the ancient vernacular, uh, you know, if they're afraid of uh, what's going to happen to their farms or, you know, what's going to happen to their legacies, Athens put something in place. They had something in place. I should also point out it wasn't a lot of money and they still had to pay for their own food and they still had to pay for their own equipment. But of course, the hope was that you'd get loot from a campaign so you could make that back somehow. Yeah, that was one thing that I, uh, when I started doing these uh, Peloponnesian War episodes, it was something that I didn't know. And it was interesting to learn that they had to pay for their own food and say at Eretria or whatever. The Eretrians would have mini agora outside <laughs> where they could buy their stuff to eat something that I'd never came across or heard, like the logistics of that. Like logistics is everything. It's yeah. not something I really thought about. I just took it for granted that they supply <laughs> themselves, like modern militaries, like supply their own food. No, it wasn't the case. We know in Athens, for instance, you were told to come to muster with three days rations. But then a quick cursory glance at their military history will tell you that didn't go far. You know, it it would get you probably on a raid to Megara and back. But, you know, anywhere else, that's not going to go far. You've got to start paying your own way, paying for your own food. And of course, as any military logistical strategist knows continuously paying men the longer you're in the field becomes very hard i mean there's lots of examples of it towards the end of the peloponnesian war and into the corinthian war but perhaps the best example is in xenophon's and abacus in which he literally describes cyrus having to deal with this problem they hadn't even got to the battle of canaxa they hadn't even got to their first objective and he had already run out of money and couldn't pay his men and of course the immediate fear if you don't pay your men is mutiny. And this is a serious problem in not just all ancient armies, but in particular Greek armies. Because you can't even violently discipline a Greek army unless you're Spartan. Well, especially in Athens, democracy, everyone's allegedly equal. They really do not like physical discipline. Um, it is not accepted. And we do see mutinies under Spartan commanders by uh, Greek allies. So they didn't have decimation, is what you're saying? No, they did not. <laughs> Even the Spartans only really had a stick. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, they had some other kind of punishments. I can't remember if it's Plutarch that describes it, but there is one description of them um, having to hold up a aspis at arm's length as a physical punishment for discipline, things like that. But in Athens, for instance, and in Argos, we know this in Argos as well, discipline waited until you got back. So if you, if you did something categorically bad... So say you ran away or you neglected to engage with the enemy or anything like this. You weren't disciplined on the spot. You were disciplined back in your polis. You know, the Argos, they had a tribunal type of area outside their city. Yeah, a trench. Like river that was no longer a riverbed. That's what it was. Yeah. That's it. It's a riverbed. Yeah, you're right. And you're tried in there and you're killed in there if you're found wanting. Uh, Thucydides describes it. And then he describes the Spartans punishing their king for the exact same crime. And the Spartan response is, we're going to take all your money and burn down your house, which has a very uh, Gangs of New York feel about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> then he makes it up at uh, Mantinea. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But an interesting insight to show you that, you know, not even um, Spartan kings were immune from this form of discipline. We were talking earlier, uh, you had mentioned about, like, you had to show up with rations. One of the things that doesn't really get talked about a lot in popular history is that it wasn't just soldiers. Like you had slaves that would carry your rations and stuff with yep. you, like baggage trains and stuff. That's kind of gets glossed over. Not all popular history, just, you know, the movie 300 glossed over. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're not actually carrying your equipment for the most part or your rations. You have a slave or slaves carrying it, which is something that most modern people aren't, aren't accustomed to thinking about. 
a hoplite was a very brave but very lazy. So <laughs> <laughs> I jest. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, as lo- assuming you could afford to bring your slave with you, because of course it depends how many slaves you have at home. That's true. It depends uh, how many male slaves you have at home. Are you going to bring your female slave? I mean, you might well do. We just have no evidence. The best evidence for this is actually a play by Menander. So slightly later than the classical period. It's just after um, Alexander the Great. Uh, he wrote a play which we only have 60-70% of. And it's called, um, it's called The Aspis. And it's all about a slave who went to war with his mercenary master. His master seemingly dies on the battlefield. And he comes home and tells everyone, basically. But the, the whole thing's a comedy because his master didn't actually die. Uh, well, he misidentified the body. Because basically, the body was mutilated. It was out in the sun. This is something else people don't like talking about, which is the war dead. Which is, well, actually, my research specialism. But, you know, that's the other element we don't talk about. So Menander's Aspis is probably the only time we really see categorically. Of course, we know the attendants, as they're euphemistically called, are there. We see that in some of the artwork as well. But they're just not discussed. They're not described. And ultimately, when you think about who's writing these, um, these are wealthy Thucydides is a wealthy Athenian. He owns freaking mines. Herodotus <laughs> is a wealthy man from Halicarnassus. He's so wealthy he can go traveling in exile and still be fine. You know, Xenophon himself is a cavalryman, so he has to be. Uh, <laughs> he just kind of, by definition, has to be wealthy. You know, these are our three main historians. They do not particularly have an interest in what the poorest of the poor, the slaves, the, uh, those who are not free in any sense, are up to and are doing unless it's pertinent to what they're talking about and of course when you're on campaign they can get raids and take slaves and their slaves will be carrying their booty back as well so yeah absolutely which kind of reminds me um xenophon does mention this in his analysis mainly because he's talking about how brilliant he is so he makes the brilliant strategic decision to basically get rid of excess baggage and that includes women and children whilst out on campaign. So here we have at least you know, an acknowledgement of the baggage train. We have an acknowledgement of who's in the baggage train. We also have um, little stories of people trying to hide their favourites. So your favourite female slave, your favourite maybe prostitute, maybe a young boy, uh, whatever it is. We do get some evidence that, you know, okay, we'll get rid of them, but I'm going to hide this one in my baggage so no one notices because uh, I like them. Very Julius Caesar in his humility. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Xenophon is a favourite for that. I do. Uh, he is my favourite author. Uh, he brings real colour and life to uh, Greek history. Also, Thucydides talks quite a bit about the baggage train too, especially when they're fleeing Sicily yes. before they get massacred at the river. Yeah. You can talk about it too with the experience of war, but he's very uh, descriptive of the sadness and uh, the moroseness of the situation. Yes, absolutely. It is. It's a harrowing absolutely harrowing passage like you say we'll talk about that in a bit uh, i'm just thinking in terms of great warfare you've mentioned it before which is this this model we have which is of orthismos so orthismos meaning push basically and this has been a sort of a dominant model in historiography of great warfare for a long time and has been in my mind convincingly but not to everyone uh, has been criticized and sort of picked apart so it's this idea that a phalanx is a block of men in a tight formation smashing into another block of men in a tight formation. As the shields hit, what then happens? To which their answer is Othismos, the push. And then uh, it is argued that the ranks of men behind their job is to push the front line. And so you've got this sort of pushing match going on as is. I should point out this model has been criticized since i think the earliest paper i found that criticized this was in like 1944 so it has it has a long um, line of criticism and the criticism comes from the fact that there's very little evidence for it the word orthismos barely appears in battle narratives i think it's about four maybe five times it appears and in the majority of those it's metaphorical and it is metaphorical you know it's the idea we're going to do one big push to clear them from the field or you know and then they gave one great push what we you know if you want to say that literally yes okay a push i can see where you got that but it could also just be one great exertion you know in much the same way we'd use it in military in sports and the like so it could be a a tactical maneuver but not something that is in every battle so to speak yeah that's an interesting idea 
like a commander once did or something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would imagine you'd have to train for that, though. It'd have to be very coordinated. This is ultimately your problem. Greek armies are amateur. Even though they got paid for being out there, they're still amateurs. They do not train. Or they very rarely train, if they train at all. The Spartans seem to be the ones who train the most, and they don't train very much. As proven by the fact they only really have one manoeuvre. You know, if you think of the Spartans as full-time warriors constantly training in warfare, why do they only ever do one move? Which is basically unfurl to the flank, come to the side and do like a counter phalanx and push in, creating a sort of a gamma shape, an L shape. Uh, That's their one move and that's it. So they train more on athletical prowess as opposed to tactical maneuvering. Exactly. If you're going to say the Spartans train, you cannot realistically describe that as military training. It is athletic training. It is gymnastic training. I would never argue that the Spartans weren't fit. You know, they clearly would have been fit. Every one of them had rock hard abs, apparently. Of course. The documentary I saw, 300, tells me this. (laughs) Yeah, so, you know, but that's not the same. That's not military training as in a tactical level. I mean, we know Agesileos, great Spartan commander, wants to accumulate the best soldiers around him or the, the best combatants around him in his army whilst he's in Asia. So this is the beginning of the 4th century. And he puts on a contest, basically, with, you know, prizes and awards. And it's, you know, on horseback, who can throw the best javelin, who can do the best riding, peltas, who can throw the best, who can throw the most accurately, the, the furthest, archers, who's the best shot, and then hoplites. Who's the best looking? Who's in the best shape? That is the contest of hoplites. And you kind of think, huh, that's how you determine the best hoplite. That's revealing. Because it's not about your prowess with a spear. It's not about your prowess with a shield. It's not about your ability to stand in a line. That's not even courage that's being tested. It is your... I mean, the term's kind of like kalos. It's beauty or fineness. So what are we looking at? Athletic body. You're in good shape. Is fundamentally how he's deciding the best hoplite. So with all this time that they have to train, since the Helotiliotes are doing all of the work and the Perioico run their economy and the Laconian economy, do they win all of the uh, Olympic Games in Pythian? And, I mean, you would think so, right? <laughs> you, would, you would think so. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, they don't. And there's an interesting... At the moment, I'm writing a popular history book on Pancratian, which is a combat sport in ancient Greece. Um, it's a mixture of wrestling, boxing, and basically brawling. Forerunner of MMA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it's described now, uh, the front runner of MMA, uh, UFC and the like. There's an interesting phenomenon, which is that we have the list of Olympic victors throughout the classical period, pretty much. Uh, there is not one Spartan on it. And in boxing, they rarely appear. Wrestling, I'm pretty sure they don't appear. This causes problems in the historiography. Uh, in the ancient world in particular, they did not like this because it goes against the Spartan mirage, which is, you know, this idea that the Spartans were great warriors, great fighters. So of course, they should be the greatest combat sportsmen. You know, they should be the best boxers, the best wrestlers, the best pancratiasts, and they're not there. So how do they deal with that? There then comes a tradition, a Roman tradition, really, that the Spartans were banned from competing in boxing, Pancratian, and wrestling outside of Sparta. And that's basically how they explained it. So we're kind of stuck in the middle here. Did the Spartans actually not let their men fight in the combat sports in Olympia? Or is it just that they didn't win? And we don't like that because it doesn't fit this model we have. Uh, But going back to your question about generally athletics, you know, not just combat sports. No, the Spartans do not dominate at all. They're there. We do see them, but they don't dominate. Yeah, if they're such, like, badass uh, hoplites, or for lack of a better term, <laughs> you'd yes. think that they would be, like, destroying the javelin competition, or yep. you know, the hoplitodromos. <laughs> well, that would be the one, wouldn't it? <laughs> you'd think they would sweep <laughs> yeah, money. Yeah. There's only one victor, but you, if there was a first, second, third, fourth, fifth sort of thing, you'd think they would sweep it all. They'd sweep it all, they'd take it all, but no, no, we don't get it. This is when you're, I've always reminded of um, Aristotle, who talks about why the Spartans were superior militarily. And he says, basically, it's because they trained and no one else did. And to prove his point, he then reminds everyone that the Thebans began to train and then immediately won. And, you know, they win the Battle of Lutra. They then have hegemony. Uh, And you're kind of like, oh, so 
what that basically means is the Spartans were the only ones training, but clearly weren't training much because the Thebans could catch them up in a generation by training 300 men and no more. So, you know, <laughs> yes, the Spartans trained. No, they're not this super uh, human uh, polis that they're made out to be in this regard. Because ultimately, all Spartan citizens could train. Athenian citizens could train if they had enough money. You know, if they, were, if they had the money for leisure time. That's ultimately what athletics was to the ancient world. It was a symbol status or because you must have leisure time to be able to do this. But if you had enough money, then you could just buy a chariot and you can become a victor that way. <laughs> exactly. And do it the Alcibiades way. <laughs> Without the training, the shortcut. Exactly. That's absolutely it. So yeah, that's exactly that. It's exactly that. So yeah, to kind of reiterate, no, the Spartans do not dominate. They are training, but they're not the only ones who can. So we talked quite a bit about Marathon and as like the first of the 5th century with Herodotus, but it's an anormal style of battle. It, uh, it evolves as we get through the 5th century, and by the time you get to the Peloponnesian War, you see a lot more incorporation of like cavalry, and I cannot say cavalry right, and I poked at it all the time in my podcast. I've seen those comments. They're very rude. I just can't. It's one of those... I'm from Pennsylvania, uh, so like near Amish country, so like my L's and my R's are all... Whatever. But anyway, uh, yeah. I digress. Um, but we see the incorporation more of cavalry, cavalry horsemen and lightly armed troops do you want to talk about that a little bit because we've completely ignored them for the most part so far yeah we have we have completely ignored them and i suppose that's kind of reflective of um, the historiography up till about the 90s now perhaps that's not true of the cavalry but it certainly is a light infantry yeah so the hoplite model ignores everyone else it ignores cavalry and the cavalry are downplayed even when they are active and light infantry are only discussed usually when they're doing something decisive. So their general skirmishing and that is not overtly discussed in the source material. And there are ideological reasons for that. The hoplite is the Greek ideological zenith. I suppose the American version would be he is your all American. As an ideological product, he's what you want to be. To Athens in particular, he embodies democracy to them. He embodies bravery, he embodies strength, both their political strength and also their military strength. And we see this reflected not only in Thucydides, Xenophon, both of them Athenian, we also see this in legal speeches. So people who are throwing insults at other people in a defense or a, a prosecution will often bring up military service because every citizen in Athens has to serve in the military. And so, you know, there's people being said, um, you know, oh, they're accusing me of this, that and the other, but I gave up the opportunity to be a cavalryman and chose to be a hoplite because that was the right thing to do. And that is the most courageous thing to do. So, you know, we even see the richest of the rich in Athens basically wanting to look like a hoplite and so it's kind of no surprise that our source material emphasizes the hoplite in battle as doing most of the work. So a lot of this is piecemeal. You've got to kind of bring it together. But it is quite clear cavalry and light infantry are feared in Greek warfare because they are seriously problematic to a hoplite formation. The Battle of Potidaea, for example, I when I was putting the episode together on that, there was very little mention of like the cavalry. And then you read Plato's symposium account where Alcibiades is in the cavalry and apparently has a huge role in it. Yeah. And then, like Socrates is a hoplite soldier. So it's kind of like even in Thucydides kind of just downplays it too, how they're being implemented. I mean, yeah. other than like, you know, when one phalanx means another phalanx and oh, then the cavalry come and kind of, you know, pick everybody off from behind. <laughs> That's their role. <laughs> Yeah, and this is the um, this is reflected in Athenian speeches, where basically they're described as hiding from battle until the end. Fundamentally, we see this in all military systems. So, for instance, I don't know what it's like in the US, and I'm suddenly very aware that you're in Air Force, and, but over here, our Air Force has a bit of a reputation for uh, within military circles for often not putting the work in, or you know, being far away. They can say that because they're over there, kind of thing. You know, it's unfair, it's unrealistic, but you know, this is how people prioritize their own activity in war. So the hoplite, in this sense, always takes center stage. And the cavalry, oh, they only turn up for the massacre at the end. 
But then if you think about it, that's quite an important job. Actually finishing the battle, seeing the enemy off the field. And that's also light infantry. Light infantry would be doing this as well. And that's when most of the, the deaths occur. Yeah, that's exactly it. They don't happen in the phalanx clash for whatever that looks like. That's not where the majority of these deaths occur. They occur in the route. And it's also worth reiterating that actually death counts in hoplite based battles are very, very low. Very low indeed. Uh, you're talking not even 15% on the losing side in most battles. So these aren't massive massacres, but still sizable and still worthy of the respect that they incur. Depending on if you had uh, enough money for a full array of equipment, you probably left with quite a bit of slashes on your calves and forearms and stuff too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right there. And of course, you can't throw away your shield no matter how much you want to, because then you'd, you'd end up in court for basically running from your post. You'd dismiss, you know, the throwing of your shield is the most cowardly thing you could do. Of course, they bloody did it, because survival instincts kick in. I mean, wouldn't you just have multiple shields so you just go home and pick up <laughs> and be like, no, I still have my shield. <laughs> oh, dear. I'd like to think so. But <laughs> yes, I certainly would. Like, if you're rich enough. I mean, yeah. I know some people might not be, but if you're rich enough, you, you have multiple shields. So I don't want to die. And get down. It's right there. It's right there. <laughs> So yeah, so the other thing with um, light infantry in particular, so we're starting to appreciate the role of cavalry over the past sort of 30 years. There's a real growth in the respect of what the cavalry does on a battlefield and Greek awareness of that. It seems to kind of like cavalry are there and then all of a sudden Alexander just, he figures out how to use them. It's like, not that's not really the case. <laughs> no, exactly that. And of course, because we have an Athenocentric, very Athens-based source material, you wonder how different our perspective would be if it was Theban or Thessalian, two of which had very well-regarded cavalries. Same with the Syracusans, another very well-respected cavalry force. But the Athenians had a cavalry force. Beginning of the Peloponnesian War, they've got one. So, you know, it, just because they're not pushed to the front doesn't mean they're not there. But they didn't seem to know how to use it the best, though. Like, it was frustrating sometimes. It's like, yeah. it's like you're going to Sicily... And the Syracusans, as you mentioned, have like one of the best cavalries, and you decide to only take like three hundred on like the second later reinforcements. They would have brought cavalry with them in their specifically designed horse carriers that they have. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to say that they would have been victorious. I don't think conquest of Sicily was anything that was really possible. No, of course That's not. I digress. But you know, you wouldn't have gotten slaughtered on the plains as easily if you had cavalry to put up a fight against theirs. Yeah. There's a work by Xenophon on the cavalry commander. So basically, it's a, almost like a manual, a military manual, specifically about cavalry, how to train them, where to train them, things like that. And on the surface of it, you're like, oh, we have evidence for how the Athenians like train their cavalry. That's good. And then you realize as you read it, he's written this because the Athenians are rubbish. He's trying to tell them how to fix it. And of course, he spent time in a lot of different armies, uh, whether it's the mercenary army of Cyrus, the 10,000 themselves, where he has to create a an ad hoc cavalry force to solve problems. He then joins Agas Agasileos' army. You know, he has a lot of experience from a lot of different military systems. Comes back himself, an avid horseman, writes the book, oh, for goodness sake, Athenians, can you do this properly, please? And that's 4th century, almost mid-4th century. So, no, the Athenians never master this. There is also the sad moment in build-up to Second Mantinea, mid 4th century, where Xenophon describes a, a cavalry skirmish the day before, or maybe two days before, and there's a couple of deaths on the Athenian cavalry forts, and the sort of the sad note is that actually one of those deaths was Xenophon's own son. So there's a real poignancy to what seems like a really arbitrary thing to be describing, because Xenophon doesn't put all this detail all the time, and obviously it's because of that close connection with one of the, one of the men that fell. I always thought of like a it's like a big what if. It's like, you know, what if the Athenians actually took cavalry seriously? How different the 4th century might have been? Maybe, maybe not. But <laughs> Maybe. The other one is, what if um, Sparta actually invested in a navy earlier? Yeah, there's a few ifs. The cavalry one is an interesting one. It is an interesting one. Especially as they had such success when they really embraced light infantry. So light infantry is a very different kettle of fish. Light infantry appears throughout the Peloponnesian War. And from the beginning, it is decisive. 
and yet historians so often ignore it until recently and it's because they often disappear from narratives and because you know uh, our authors aren't particularly that interested in them all the time in the same way they are with hoplites or with triremes or the like so we see beginning of the Peloponnesian War you've got probably the most famous or should be the most famous is Demosthenes' experience in Aetolia so the Aetolian disaster he faces when he f- he's fighting a Greek force don't forget a Greek force who is predominantly using what we might term guerrilla tactics, light infantry, using the terrain to their advantage and pretty much massacring hoplite forces whenever it encounters it. And Demosthenes seemingly learns from this disaster. He's one of my favorite commanders uh, of, the, of the war. Oh, he has to be, doesn't he? He's, he's got to be, because he learns from that disaster. The thing with Demosthenes' use of light infantry tactics is then he masterminds Sphacteria. Sphacteria, obviously this great disaster for the Spartans, the first time allegedly they've ever surrendered or were expected to ever surrender, and, you know, sent shockwaves through Greece and all this. Ultimately, Demosthenes worked out from his experience in Aetolia how to use light infantry to destroy a strong, solid hoplite force, and a Spartan force no less. And he uses archers, he uses light infantry, so we're looking at peltas, we're looking at people who can't afford the kit to be a hoplite. So some of these will be citizens, some of them may not be. And they basically show that an isolated hoplite force is useless. That's ultimately what he proves. And we see the exact same thing later on with Iphicrates and the Battle of Lycaon, where he does the exact same thing. But everyone looks at Iphicrates as the great innovator, and he's not. Demosthenes had already done this. And Demosthenes had done it because the Aetolians had already done it. So you see, there's this. Uh, we like to think of revolutions or the revolutionary people, and what we see in Greek warfare is continuity, fundamentally. And, and the Thracians were known for it as peltast. Yes, exactly that. So we accept light infantry exist. We accept that they're dynamic. We accept that you know even now we'll accept they actually can dominate a hoplite force in the right circumstances. The fact that they're constantly at battles tells us that even in a shall we say, a uh, large pitched battle in which there were like maybe four, they must have a purpose. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. They must have a purpose. We then jump immediately onto, as you have, as I do, as everyone does, who uh, looks at Greek warfare, light infantry, good light infantry, that means peltasts. What no one talks about are the archers. We are told categorically by Thucydides, according to Pericles, I think it is, that at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, Athens has a standing force of 1,600 archers. That's a lot of archers. I mean, the walls are pretty long. You needed them on the walls to to keep people at bay. (laughs) Well, this is it. They clearly have a role in siege warfare. There's no question. They clearly have a role in siege warfare. They clearly have a role in naval warfare. Admittedly, it's Herodotus, but he describes archers as a... to be included in basically any crew of a trireme. Uh, when you're numbering a trireme's crew, you have a certain number of marines, and I think it's four archers. Is that true for every trireme? I don't know, but it gives you the idea that archers are always present. If a trireme is in the sea, they will have an archer group on it. As I mentioned, I just did the episode, the Battle of Syracuse, and one of the funny anecdotes of that is like the waves were so choppy that the archers couldn't shoot straight, so they just start pelting stones at each other. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh. Yes. It is quite lovely. That makes it very vivid that there's archers on deck shooting it against other archers. And you also have the whole the whole incident where they they have to protect the divers that go and cut down these entrances and stuff. And you have like very innovative warfare and the naval aspect and the land aspect during this war. Yeah, it is. It's very innovative. It's also very pragmatic. So we see this especially in siege warfare. Greek siege warfare gets a very bad reputation because they're rubbish at it, basically. But when you look at the financial limitations they're working under, when you look at the time limitations they're working under, you know, this is seasonal warfare, or supposed to be seasonal warfare for most part. Whilst you can leave a force in a place for a siege, you can't leave large numbers because you've got to have the fields harvested and and the like. And you've got to be able to feed yourself. Exactly. Exactly that. So siege warfare, you know, we don't see the great towers. We don't see the great trebuchets of medieval period. And we don't see, you know, torsion propelled rocks and ballistas from 
Well, we do see some proto flamethrowers later. Yes, we do. <laughs> we will talk about those in a minute. I love those. Okay. <laughs> this is what I mean. They're innovative under the restraints that they're under. The other issue they have for siege warfare is you don't have cannon fodder because the majority of your men are citizens. And citizens, as I said earlier, vote when to go to war. And they vote for who's going to be strategos, who's going to be the general. You know, they have power. They have, author- they have as much authority as everyone else. And even in Sparta, where perhaps you could argue they don't, they're too valuable. So you can't just throw wave upon wave upon wave against a wall until you break through. It does not work. You will run out. And it is just a bad idea. These are the constraints they're working under. And so, you know, they can build a siege ramp. But then, as shown at the Siege of Plataea, you can just dig that ramp from under it. You know, the Plataeans break through their own walls and just dig the soil away. And then we see the Spartans try and use fire innovatively, and it doesn't go very well. We see something similar, actually, in Xenophon's and Abbasis, the Siege of the Drilli, the use of fire within a siege context. And of course, you've got the example you gave, which is the flamethrower prototype. Amazing feat of off-the-cuff engineering. We're basically using what was around them. It's at Delium, but it's also used by Brasidas in Chalcidiki. He uses the exact same machine. And that's the bit people forget or don't realise is said by Thucydides. And the two events occur in the same year. So Thucydides describes one and then describes the other. So to him, they're clearly linked. And the flamethrower is the one common denominator. So, you know, they split a log in half, hollow it out, put a metal tube in, place this on a couple of wagons. You know, this isn't high-end engineering. And then basically put a cauldron of coals on one end, a billow, and then shoot flames through. It's very effective. It works perfectly at Delium against a wooden fort built by the Athenians. And it works very well again uh, in a wooden fort built by the Athenians in Chalcidiki. I always wish there was like a some sort of scientist engineer type that could be attributed to. You know, like Archimedes has um, all these fascinating defensive stuff that he creates later, but there's like no figure in the Peloponnesian War that any of this is like attributed to. I always wish there was. Yeah, yeah, I, I do know what you mean. It would be nice, wouldn't it? And then for basically a historian to go, yeah, but it probably wasn't. <laughs> probably just like a spur of the moment. Let's try this. See if this works. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is then the next question, which is, if it was just a delium, I think you'd be right. But the fact that it appears in two places independently suggests that this may be a weapon that's been around for a bit. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. Like, that's how it started. And not necessarily it, it was brand new idea, but like it happened somewhere else that was not recorded. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. And this is the problem with um, Thucydides in particular, who likes to tell you something once and then never again. Because he then assumes that you'll just project that knowledge. <laughs> so any time, so for instance, he describes a siege ramp once, and then never mentions it again. He mentions a lot of sieges, but never mentions a siege ramp again. Are we to assume that no one ever made one again? Are we to assume that a siege ramp was just commonplace? He just assumes that we're experts now on sieges. <laughs> he mentions it, and you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I go for the latter. I assume, we, I think we're meant to assume this is now just commonplace. This is what's occurring. But, you know, pits anyone with, with within their right to go, well, he doesn't say it again. So you're making that up. And that's kind of valid. So, yes, yeah, so the siege warfare is innovative at the lower end because of their restraints. I think you're right. I think naval warfare is probably the most innovative. Military, uh, sorry, land warfare, I feel is adaptable. And I think that's what we see. And that's why it's so hard to build a model of Greek warfare, because different commanders adapt, are constantly adapting to what's around them, constantly adapting to who they're facing, how big their army is, what's in their army, what's in the army opposite, what's the geographic landscape in which they're fighting, all normal things that you'd expect a commander to adapt to. And that's kind of why it's hard to build this model and to sort of say, yes, there is a phalanx against a phalanx, and this is how phalanx warfare is fought, because then you quickly go, yes, unless there's a hill involved. Which is like 75% of Greece. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Or unless there's a river involved. or <laughs> You know, it becomes um, an impossible task. Yeah, that's just something that I always thought. It's like, how did this develop in this country when this country is not a flat country at all? How is this like the mode that they thought would be the best way to fight each other. And light infantry really didn't come to the fore. I mean, I guess it has to do more with what you were talking about earlier with the status of equipment and that sort of thing, meaning your higher class. But like 
this is not the best way to fight in that country <laughs> no no I, but it is probably the most effective way of using a militia and that's ultimately what they're using if you think about it, an archer needs to be trained you know an archer needs to be trained for a long time a cavalryman needs horse training you know and that's something xenophon really bangs on about light infantry possibly less so maybe more tactical awareness but then throwing a javelin is a required skill we haven't discussed slingers either you know using a sling is a required skill oh, sorry an acquired skill you need to acquire this but these aren't professionals which is probably why they end up bringing in mercenaries a lot for a lot of these specialist skills at least to begin with archers creep for instance uh, light infantry like you said thrace is one of the areas they draw that from but the athenians in particular do start to invest more in this so you know there are athenian citizens who would have been in the light infantry there are athenian citizens who would have become archers and pay taxes you know we've got inscriptions of them paying taxes at the lyceum which is a precinct of the temple of apollo categorically states that archers pay a tax so they're there they're training they're uh, they're using that lyceum for that practice that an archer needs but it's all piecemeal you've got to kind of piece all this together because of all the issues we've been discussing <laughs> with, with the source material. You know, you can just give any 20-year-old brand new Athenian citizen a shield, and put him in the middle of a phalanx and just say, push forward. <laughs> yeah. Keep well, momentum going forward. <laughs> ultimately, his job is to not run away. That is a hoplite's job. And it's, it's one of those classic things in a shield wall, in a phalanx, in any form of line of heavy infantry. As long as you do not run away, your chances of winning increase exponentially. Actually, I think that's fair to say of all combat. If you do not run away, you, uh, and that's it. So you just need them to stand their ground. That's all you need them to do. Unless you're feigning a retreat to turn around and slice them. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you're going to be fancy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's a set of the Spartans, isn't it? They were capable of doing this. Oddly enough, talking about film depictions of this kind of thing, everyone obviously jumps to 300 and it's ludicrous depiction of a phalanx. A strangely accurate one would be... Have you ever seen Dwayne Johnson's Hercules? I have not yet, but it's on my to-watch list. Oh, okay. Dwayne Johnson's one has a scene where he trains... Hop, where he basically trains a phalanx. And it's one of those really weird moments where he really... Or the script really succinctly it captures how a phalanx works. Not in terms of a thismos, not in terms of lining up. Do not run and you will win the day. That is it. That's all he basically says. All I want from you is do not run away. <laughs> and it's one of those weird moments where you're watching this this film. It's very tongue in cheek, you know, not a masterpiece in cinematic terms, uh, but a good fun film. I enjoy it. I, I like the film. I have to put that on my quarantine list of things to watch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just this weird moment where it just I, I was just watching this, going, yes, that is exactly what you need to do in a phalanx. Well done, Dwayne Johnson. Uh, <laughs> I would imagine if he was in a phalanx, he would not run. <laughs> no, and I imagine you'd be petrified of being the one in front of him. <laughs> He's very Ajax-like. Yes, I could see that. Oh, dear. Yeah, I could definitely see that. So, yeah, so the other issues, you know, as we're kind of talking about, trying to reconstruct battle, trying to reconstruct how it's being fought, and you realise that actually battle and, you know, any, any soldier I've ever met with combat experience says the same. It is chaos. You're trying to define chaos, and it's impossible to do. So, you know, we start to buy into ideologies, whether it's Athenian ideology, the hoplite reigns supreme, whether it's Spartan ideology, the Spartans reign supreme, whether it's even modern ideology. So, you know, there's the traditional view, this old, dare I say, old-fashioned view now of hoplite warfare, you know, phalanx, othismos, hoplite being the middle-class farmer, None of this light infantry and running away and coming back and hit and run, none of that. That's all tied up in ideology, modern ideology. Uh, there is, of course, the famous book, The Western Way of War, in which the author literally says, this is the honourable way of fighting. The Greeks do it the honourable way, the right way. And it's the evil Eastern people who do it this dirty way. And, you know, to this trickery, deceit, distance, range... You know, there's no honor. There's no what the Greeks might call Aegon, that competition. It's that school of thought. I know what book you're talking about. I've read it and similar authors that predominantly influenced my view of Greek warfare before I started the podcast. And that's kind of how my initial episode is kind of pushed through, which is why I kind of want to update it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's completely understandable. And they are still the dominant names. 
but their views are being challenged more and more. And in particular, the Western way of war really exposed just how ideologically driven this model was. And, you know, it's really getting caught up in it. So, you know, like, oh, the Greeks are not just heavy infantry militia just trying to survive. Now they are doing it the right way, the proper way. You know, this is the foundation of European identity, of Western identity, Western warfare. And you kind of like, one, that's just not an acceptable model to be using. And two, actually, does the evidence say that at all? To which the answer is no. We see a sphacteria guerrilla tactics we see the anatolia Aetolians using guerrilla to what we might call guerrilla tactics demosthenes masters it aphicrates masters it you know we see deceit we see traps so we talked about marathon as being the first battle that you can kind of try and piece together really the first battle you can reconstruct is olpi which is in the archidamian war which is a greek force against a greek force and it's the first real greek versus greek battle we can reconstruct we can put together and it describes an ambush. An ambush is planned. So you have, in this apparently non-deceitful form of warfare, who don't do hit and run and don't do trickery, the very first battle we can reconstruct says, yes, they do. And they're pretty good at it, too. So, yeah, so, you know, it's not just ancient ideology we need to be wary of when reconstructing this. We've got to be really careful of our own and, you know, the ones that we've absorbed. Because you're right, we... we You've started uh, in quite traditional academic work. I did the same over here. I was strongly influenced by Paul Cartledge, who's a great writer, absolutely brilliant writer, but quite traditional in his views on Greek warfare. And then, as you say, you start to get exposed to more and more of the debate and how it's changing. And it certainly is changing. I find it a bit ironic that the, the two authors that we're mainly speaking about, they've done a lot of scholarship on the Peloponnesian War, and yet they've completely... Which is where my, yeah, like, did you not understand what you were working on? Like, did you not read the battles? (laughs) Did you just ignore that evidence? (laughs) I must admit, one of the reasons I wrote my first book was, one, so that I made sure I had read every single battle narrative before I then started to talk about Greek warfare. Because I started to notice, don't get me wrong, not the top-end academics uh, in this field. Of course, they know these battles inside out. But sort of people who talk about warfare but isn't quite their specialism clearly hadn't read all the battles and just go to other scholarship. And you could see that. And I started to notice it more and more. And I found myself falling into that trap. So, yeah, you just go sit, read Thucydides, read Xenophon, and flick through Herodotus <laughs> and see, <laughs> and just see what at least the source material tells us about Greek battle. And then you realize it is absolute chaos and innovative and adaptable and not revolutionary. This is the thing everyone likes to throw. We've talked about this a couple of times. Iphicrates, revolutionary. Epaminondas, the Theban general, great innovator who does nothing new. If you actually look at all the other battles, he does nothing new. Uh, But we like to have, I mean, like like we were talking about with the um, flamethrower, we like to have an originator, don't we? We like to have that person who taught everyone else. The Greeks like that especially, too. They love their origin. Yeah, they do. If you heard the tradition through Plutarch that Philip II learned everything he knew from Epaminondas, there's a tradition that he was kidnapped, or that's not true, uh, sort of um, exchanged as a, a ransom prisoner, so to speak, uh, and lived in Thebes for a small amount of time. And that's where he learned how to fight properly and then went back to Macedon and then revolutionized Macedonian warfare. It's sort of tapping into this tradition you know we need an explanation and that explanation needs to be one person or you know one area so you know he must have got it from thebes because of course it has to come from somewhere it has to be like a divine inspiration it can't just be like a long evolution of building upon yeah it's the thing isn't it the idea of evolution the idea of trial and error the idea of things just kind of changing as they go on lots of different factors this is boring (laughs) People don't like this. <laughs> and it's too multifaceted. The more multifaceted you make an explanation, um, the harder it is to believe. Back to what you said, though, about how like most of the Peloponnesian War was innovative in their strategies. It's like it's kind of what you want from a commander. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want him to be able to lead and you want innovation when it calls for it. Yeah, so it's like that's exactly what the Greeks did. But yet we have this idea that they fought one monolithic way and their commanders didn't really have much of a role. It was the hoplite 
citizens who just did everything the way they were supposed to. It was who was tougher, basically. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. It's not necessarily the case, because everybody flees. At least one side flees <laughs> in every battle. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it, isn't it? I mean, over here, the analogy in, in the old English or sort of European scholarship was one of um, the sport rugby. So in rugby, you've got the scrum, which is the coming together of the front lines, uh, to the forward lines. I guess you kind of have it in American football, but not as regimented. And, you know, it's the idea of sportsmanship, of just courage and strength and, and that. And that and it explains the low death counts because, you know, they're not there to kill people. They're there to just show superiority. But, you know, as we pointed out, that is very easy to present if you ignore the cavalry and you ignore the route afterwards and the light infantry going around killing everyone. And, you know... But, you know, it's this kind of, uh, pro- uh, not professional, gentlemanly conduct. You know, whenever I read this, I imagine that this should be written by like a, a sort of a turn of the 20th century English vicar. Just talking about, you know, the right way of doing things. <laughs> the expression over here is, it's just not cricket to do otherwise. <laughs> oh, so you said like the gentlemanly conduct of war. It made me think of like, I hear a lot about like Thucydides. He's like this philosophical gentleman's way of, conducting war a lot of people talk about it like that not academics but just people in general like this is like a higher way of like how war and diplomacy should be done and especially now in modern times when Thucydides is all the rage again apparently and but anyway uh, <laughs> but it's just like did you, did you guys actually read Thucydides it's pretty <laughs> brutal and not quote-unquote gentleman like it's he his descriptions are pretty he talks quite a bit about the psychological effect of the warfare yeah it's not this what you should aspire to be and he's actually pointing a light on the brutality of quote-unquote civilized people in a long war yeah this is the immediate problem when we start to project ourselves into the past so you know the athenians are like us the Thucydides is doing it the right way just like the way we think is the right way you then have to ignore the social context and the military context in which he's writing and what he's writing about and you're absolutely right. Great warfare is horrifically brutal. This is not a nice experience at all. It is tiring. I wouldn't want to be stuck in a phalanx with a hundred people and you can't go anywhere. <laughs> you do not want to be stuck in a phalanx. I've always assumed the worst rank to be in would probably be about the third rank. Because you can't really do anything, but you also can't run away. And there's dust all over the place, especially when you're going in the east. Man, uh, it, it would have been a terrible, terrible way of fighting. But I mean, there's not bullets lying around you, I guess. So it's, it's different, but equally terrible. It is different, yeah. But you do have, um, and this is the problem with uh, comparisons. No, there aren't bullets. No, there aren't, um, you know, there isn't artillery fire uh, to deal with. But on the same token, these people can encounter things they've never seen before. So we see a few times throughout ancient history where people get freaked out because they've seen an elephant for the first time or they've seen a camel for the first time we're told the scythians when darius invades scythia he realizes scythian horses have never seen donkeys and we're afraid of the noise donkeys make so he uses that to his advantage he makes sure the donkeys and the mules are very loud because it freaks out the scythian horses so you know no, there is not gunfire and the psychological impact that that has, especially if you're stuck in a position you cannot move from. But on the same token, there are things that would seriously impact people. Herodotus tells us in the Persian Wars that the very sight of a Persian to a Greek who had not seen one was scary because it looked so strange. You know, it's that alien nature of what a Persian in war looked like. Different dress different sort of sounds, accents coming towards him and sort of, you know, the weird language being thrown at him, different weapon shapes, all these kind of things. Many of these people have never seen before at all. And that is a seriously scary experience. It is no surprise that the dominant emotion in Greek warfare that's described is one of fear, always. I mean, many people who have uh, read any Greek history, are aware of the story of Pheidippides, the man who runs to Sparta and back again when the Persians had landed at Marathon. Uh, and then he runs to Marathon and back again, uh, and then ends up dying as a result. In his story, he meets the little fawn god, half goat, half man, Pan. And Pan basically says, if the Athenians set up a cult to me in Athens, I will help them win the Battle of Marathon. They do. He does, and the way he does this is by inspiring and eliciting strong emotional responses in the enemy 
when they least expect it or want it. He inspires panic, which is obviously where we get the word from. Things pertaining to Pan. Panic. So the, the Athenians worship Pan, or they have a cult dedicated to Pan, specifically for his ability to inspire panic. This is obviously a story in Herodotus, not Thucydides. Obviously a story in Herodotus, not Thucydides. <laughs> You're absolutely right. What we also know is that the Spartans had a cult, not to Pan and panic, but to Phobos. Phobos being the deification, the personification of fear. And obviously where we get the word phobia from. He's the son of Ares. He is the son of Ares, yeah. Him and, is it Danos, I think it is, which is danger or something like that. So the Spartans, you've got to ask the question, why are the Spartans deifying an emotion of fear? Why are the Athenians dedicating things to a really minor agricultural god? who inspires panic. That's because that is the dominant emotion in war in particular. And these are always in the sources. These cults are related back to war, at least initially. And it's because Greek warfare is a freaking scary place to be. It is not a nice place to be at all. It's kind of like that, um, you know, if you have a fear of something and you kind of face it and you make it something that's not scary and unknown, like with the cults, like, okay, we have a cult of the god of terror, god of fear. We have a cult of Pan. We're kind of acknowledging its existence. It's happening and you can kind of like philosophically bite your lip and move forward with it sort of thing. Yeah. You control it in some way, don't you? you that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to control the uncontrollable, which is that elicitation of, of that strong emotion that it guides your action as a result. I mean, like you're absolutely right because the other one that just jumped to mind is the Spartans had a cult to Asclepius, sort of a human who became a god of healing, but specifically Asclepius helping with belly wounds. That's specifically what the cult is. So clearly there is a concern about being stabbed in the stomach because that's a very specific cult to have, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you think about it. <laughs> Should be rare, right? If you have a shield. You'd think so. Unless it's happening while you drop your shield and you're running. But then that would be more Asclepius and the cult of being stabbed in the back, I guess. But yeah, so this is, um, I mean, it's things like that that bring into question, you know, this idea of a line of phalanx, shield against shield, hold on, how are they getting stabbed in the stomach? Now, I think you're right there. For that to realistically happen, don't you need more space? Don't you need the shield to be moving away from the torso? You need fighting that's more Hollywood-esque, one-on-one. <laughs> exactly, Yes. Yeah, a bit of one-on-one. -on -one. No, don't get me wrong, I don't prescribe it that far. But this is circumstantial evidence. It's indirect evidence. But it does at least raise a question. You may find reenactors useful in an answer to a question like that. Because I know a lot of reenactors focus on the grip of the spear. You know, is it overhand, is it underhand? If it's underhand, does that mean they can get under the shields? If so, actually the belly becomes a target, doesn't it? If it's overhand... Is the belly a target? You need an experiment, experimental archaeology to look at that. Yeah, experimental archaeology. I guess it goes towards the not everyone probably had the same size shield. So maybe some people were more exposed towards their neck and their groin stomach area than other people as well. Yeah, well, and also height. That's true too. So, you know, even if everyone has the exact same shaped shield, the exact same size shield, I must admit my knowledge of shield dimensions is not that precise. But even just height, enough of a height deviation, you know, someone who's I don't know, 5'10", no, pretty tall, against someone who's pretty short at 5'2". You know, there's immediate disparity there, isn't there? Yeah, I think that's a valid, <laughs> it's a valid point. And human anatomy, too. Some people might just have longer torsos and shorter legs. Oh, yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, that's fair. It is quite... I've never considered that, ever. I'm going to go and badger everyone I know who does this topic. <laughs> Let's see what they say. I'm useful. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, so... The dominant, like I say, the dominant emotion is always fear. It's not one of pride. It's not one of glory. It's one of fear. Glory and pride comes afterwards. You've got ample evidence. Thucydides gives us ample evidence. But there's also lines in people like Pindar, uh, you know, the poet. He gives us um, expressions of it in the same way, which is that anyone who's experienced war does not go looking for it again. And Thucydides says this again a couple of times, specifically during the debate for the Sicilian expedition, where Nicias calls upon the elder members of the community to vote properly because the young have not experienced war. 
oh sorry specifically battle they have not experienced battle before most of them so they're looking for the glory which is the ideology which is the big funeral for the war dead it's the great monument oh i want to be just like him you know it's the heroism that comes after war but it is explicitly said more than once if you have experience of combat you do not go looking for combat again you do not just jump into it for the fun because it is not a nice experience unless you're a mercenary Unless you're a mercenary, which is completely different. And mercenaries train. <laughs> uh, That's true. It's kind of notable that um, the best examples we have of military formations, military movements, military maneuvers, tactics, is Xenophon's and Abasis and an entirely mercenary army. And if most TV shows and movies are uh, from historical periods are correct, most mercenaries drink quite a bit too, so they have blunted their senses. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, we do. Well, and of course, the Spartans are supposed to have drunk before battle a couple of times as well, but always to lose. So there's obviously a moral story going on there. But yeah. I mean, I imagine if I was going to fight in a phalanx, I would want a little bit of alcohol in my system. Yeah, a bit of Dutch courage, <laughs> a bit of Dutch courage uh, to get you in there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's some validity to that. Absolutely. <laughs> that wine, we're not going to dilute it quite as much. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so the other element of the experience of war that's always worth dwelling on is not only fear, but it is when things go wrong. So a lot of narratives, especially popular narratives, focus on the winner, and they don't really focus on the loser of a battle. The one probable exception to this is the Sicilian expedition, because Thucydides is obviously building this entire story to talk about how bad democracy is actually is in practice and how terribly this entire expedition went you know he's, he's making a lot of political points when he's telling us this story but like you mentioned when they actually are in retreat so they're trying to get out he describes in real detail just how horrific their fighting retreat is to the point where they are finally stopped many of them killed the rest taken as captives the interesting for me because of my work on the war dead the most interesting part of that is the reaction to having to leave behind the dead. This is where Thucydides describes the tears. And he describes the wailing and the crying of people and basically friends begging other people to help them carry their dead friend so that they can uh, be given proper rights. To the Greeks, to the Athenians in particular, but to the Greeks in, in total, proper funerary rights were paramount especially in warfare, in all, in all areas of life, but especially in warfare, you had to give the dead the respect they were due. To leave them on the field was an awful thing to do. We know after the naval battle of Argonusi, they the Athenians put on trial and kill their commanders because they did not return all of the war dead. That is how serious a crime this is to the Athenians in particular. I always wondered that about like naval battles, like people who died and just fluttered to the sea did they consider that to be a proper burial if they fell to the bottom of the, the ocean or are those people going to be just wandering sticks for the rest of their lives that's a really good question um the athenians had a system that dealt with that so the athenians for their war dead they had this big funeral so the idea was that you burnt your war dead on the battlefield and brought home the cremains that's the burnt bone that's left because of course i don't know how much you know about burning human bodies but human bodies don't produce ash. They produce little shards of bone. That's, that's what you get. Um, so they transport that home. That's the idea. Logistically, it'd just be easier to than carrying all the bodies back to be buried. Oh, absolutely. Especially if you're on a campaign for a year or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a logistical nightmare in its own right. I've actually written on the logistics of doing this. So there is a lot of weight involved. There's a lot of space involved. But you're right. It's much easier than carrying bodies. So you bring home the cremains. They go into 10 coffins, tribal coffins. So the Athenian military system is based on the 10 tribes. So you're buried in your tribal coffin. So that's the idea. That's the, that's the dream. That's the ideology. The state pays for all of this because you have died for the state. You are now a hero of Athens. During that burial, they bury an 11th item. So you've got the 10 coffins and you've got an 11th item, which is a funeral bed that has been made up as if there's a body in it, but there isn't a body in it, it's empty. So we have an empty bed, a funeral bed, 
that is also buried alongside everything else. And we are told by Thucydides explicitly that bed is for all those that could not be returned. And it is usually assumed, I think, probably rightly, that that refers to those most most likely those that died at sea. Because you cannot retrieve the, teeth, the dead from the sea. It's just a logistical nightmare. And so the, the symbolic burial of an empty bed is an important ideological marker for the Athenians for this reason. And is to this day. I mean, this is the reason why we have cenotaphs, meaning empty tomb. That's a reconstruction of the Athenian idea. It's the reason why we have the burial of the unknown warrior. So again, that symbolic burial of those that died that could not be brought back or those that died and could not all be given the right honours for whatever reason. I know you've got yours in the US, we've got ours here, France, Australia, New Zealand. Not every country in the world, but the majority of countries in the world have a burial of the unknown warrior. And that all stems from the Athenian practice of burying this empty bed for this ritual symbolism. I know at Marathon, they buried them on spot. Is that the only occasion on the Greek historical record where they did that and they didn't cremate them and bring them back, that we know of at least? This is kind of what Thucydides suggests, but it's one of those we just don't have enough detail. It is assumed that the funeral as we understand it probably didn't come into full fruition until maybe the mid-5th century. But we know inscriptions of the war dead had gone up slightly earlier. We know, you know, bits of the funeral may have existed before, but that's where we're in the murky area of um, Herodotus and a very large gap in our knowledge, which is kind of the second quarter of the 5th century as you enter the middle of it. We have very little evidence for this. That's reliable. There's a lot of Plutarch to guide you. And that this is when these ideas are properly being fermented. So, yes, they are buried at Marathon. Of course, you have the mound put up. And the Athenians certainly later describe this as the exception. What happened before, it's kind of anyone's guess, really. Although saying that, I've got a friend, Dr. Cesare Kutchevich, who is working literally on this question. So perhaps he'll answer it for us in a few years' time. I'll keep a lookout on it. Did you want to talk about, you said you're working on a new project about, did you want to mention it specifically instead of generally you're writing a new book on the experience of war? Yes. So uh, the research I'm doing at the moment, I've got... um, a book I'm finalizing, which is on not on the experience of war, but on the experience of transitioning to and from war for the Athenian hoplite. So how does an Athenian depart for war? Logistically, ritualistically, emotionally, what's going on? How does the family react to him being called up for war? How does, what rituals go on in the house? What happens when he leaves the house? What happens when he then joins the army? What rituals go on then? He then goes to war. I don't talk about that. I then focus on what happens when he comes home. So how does he demobilize? What happens? What are the rituals involved? What's the logistics involved? What do they do? It's things like, how are they received? So the Romans, for instance, obviously there's always the talk of the triumph, isn't there? You know, these these victorious armies coming home. Classical Greece does not describe a, a victory parade at all, anywhere. So do armies just kind of sneak in? and come home is there a celebration is there not so i look at that i look at the evidence for the potential for this homecoming as an army and then what happens when you demobilize and then you returning home and again we've got ritual we've got rituals in the home your own personal rituals in temples and in sanctuaries because many people make oaths before they go to war so when they come home they have to then fulfill their side of the bargain with a god or a cult of some description whether it's money or dedication or whatever it is. We then see him return to the family. How does the family receive him? Is he polluted in any way? Is he considered normal? Does the influence of his experience of war change the way they deal with him? To which my research suggests that yes, it does. And that there is a categoric difference in him that needs to be undone through rituals of purification. So I look at that. And then finally... How do the dead come home? Because this is a bit, this is the one section of my work that's always I found most interesting. Because if you look at any period of history and you see work on homecoming in war, whether it's with sociology, psychology, or just military history, homecoming of war, it's always with living people. No one ever asks the question about dead people. How do the dead come home? 
And in Athens, because they repatriate their dead, this becomes a really interesting question. So I look at the logistics. I look at the state control of the dead. So actually the family never gets control of their dead family member. Again, they don't even get his memory to control. The state controls his memory. They put up inscriptions about him. They're the ones who deliver his eulogy. Family don't get to do that. So you're looking at like a lot of inscriptions from the Karamikos for your work, I take it? Yeah, absolutely. Because by the turn of the 4th century, there's actually um, almost a conflict of memory in war. So we see people start to erect private memorials to people that died in state-sanctioned combat. So names like Decelaos, for instance, who's a very famous example, he's a cavalryman. We know he appears on a casualty list, an authorised Athenian casualty list. He's there, we've got it, we can see it. But we also know that his family erected a memorial to him, which kind of brings into question, did the family want to take control of that memory again? Do they want to make sure that he's remembered for all the right reasons, all the reasons they want him to be remembered for? So there's this really interesting tension between domestic and military ideology around war. And we see it not in like Thucydides' narratives. We don't see it in Xenophon's narratives. We see it in transitions, transitions of departure, transitions of homecoming. That's when someone, the hoplite, doesn't fit. And when he doesn't fit for a moment, because he's neither domestic nor military as he's departing and as he's coming home, he's no longer militarily active, but he hasn't yet entered the house. He's in this transitionary phase. He doesn't fit. And then that's when we see the true or a truer portrayal of Athenian thoughts on war, on the experience of combat and on the experience of the hoplite. And in particular, the female voice, which I don't know if you've uh, ever noticed, Thucydides never has a speaking female. So, <laughs> you know, he's a brilliant source but he does not help in a lot of areas. So yeah, so that's the um, work I'm just finishing off at the moment. I'm hoping to get that out by next year. That looks at these transitions and looks at a more nuanced experience of war as a result. That sounds fascinating. I'm actually um, very looking forward to that. I am not actually, even though I am in the military, I actually am not as interested in like the vicissitudes of battle as I am about like the diplomatic movings towards battle and the consequences and effects of a battle yeah. <laughs> that is like a higher up perspective this will be like a lower down perspective if that makes sense so this will be fall like exactly my interest not that i don't enjoy learning about battles <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> about battles but I, i've always been more fascinated by how battles yeah. come about and the consequences of them more so than like these were moved maneuvered this yeah. way and this yeah. happened this way that sort of thing. Um, and the terrain affected it this way. I'd make a terrible reenactor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also, as is the problem, we've talked about it a million times, you're reconstructing something that's impossible to reconstruct. So why are you emphasizing it? it it's interesting you talked about the build-up to battle. I have quite a few book reviews on Amazon for my first book uh, that all say a very similar thing. He spends a long time talking about the build-up to a battle. <laughs> Uh, and I thought this was just going to be about battle narratives. And you're like, that's because this is like important. <laughs> yeah. Battles don't happen in isolation. You know, the one area we didn't really talk about today because it wasn't the focus is obviously naval battle, naval campaigns. You can't talk about a naval battle in isolation. It pretty much doesn't exist. It is part of a wider campaign. And the Navy is as much an arm of politics as it is combat. So, you know, you move naval squadrons, especially the Athenians, into areas to subdue it without necessarily engaging because you just want a presence. You want a military presence. Uh, the Navy is in particular used very well in that, in that regard. Um, so, yeah, now I'm with you. If you ignore the build-up, if you ignore the political parameters, the, um, the geopolitical environment, you're left with basically half-invented narratives and you're kind of buying into this, you know, war is glorious, combat is the way uh, a man's courage is kind of epitomized, and it's just not even what the Greeks thought. So thanks for coming on, and I definitely will keep a, like a progress on when your book's going to be released. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you. Like I said, I'm hoping to get it out next year, but obviously the lockdown has slowed um, everything down. <laughs> so we shall see. Uh, but I'm hoping next year.
So if any of these listeners want to check out your work, where can they find you? Social media, website, what books of yours do you want to plug, pimp yourself out, basically? <laughs> oh, geez. So you can find links to uh, my work on my website, which is owenreese.co.uk. That has links to the, um, the two books, Great Battles of the Classical Greek World and Great Naval Battles of the Ancient Greek World. I also keep on there an update on my academic work, so, you know, uh, journal articles. I've got a journal article coming out there later this year that looks at dogs and the use of dogs in Greek warfare. Oh, dogs? Oh, dogs, wow. yeah. We didn't get to talk <laughs> about dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you ever want another chat about uh, dogs, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me know. But, yeah, um, you know, I've got work out on tattoos. I've got work out on uh, ancient history of tattoos. I've got other work out on the ward and things like that. Those are articles or are they books? Those are articles that I try and make available. Officially, I can't, but let's be honest, if I get a very nice email, you'd be amazed what I'll send you. <laughs> uh, I also am on Twitter as well. You can find me on there very easily. What is the handle on Twitter? Uh, oh, God, you know, I never search myself. I think it's at Reese History. I'll put it in the show notes for the people. <laughs> yeah, put it up in the notes to find me. Or else you could usually find me uh, commenting on one of your Twitter posts. Uh, <laughs> so I'll be around there as well. Awesome. Um, so yeah, no, thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this is fascinating. This is the highlight of my week so far in quarantine. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. What day are we on? Uh, <laughs> no, I am glad to hear that. It's certainly, um, I must admit, I, I wanted to use this to kind of re, uh, re-invoke enthusiasm, my end, because of the quarantine. And um, I've got a lot of homeschooling going on. It's quite hard to get stuck back into work, especially research. And it has done that. It has certainly done that. I've got, I've got fired up. So uh, thank you for that. Mm-hmm.